GPT-4, Claude 2, Mistral 7B, and Falcon 180B are just some of the top large language models which were released this year alone. Now, despite these being some of the best LLMs in the industry, they all have one thing in common, and that is memory. All of these large language models have a limited amount of input tokens that they can handle before they reach a limit. So this makes having in-depth conversations or dealing with large files or large PDFs an issue with these LLMs. So this is exactly where MemGPT comes in. MemGPT has been developed by researchers at the University of Berkeley, and it stands for Memory GPT, a system that intelligently manages different memory tiers in order to effectively provide extended context within the LLM's limited context window. And it also utilizes interrupts to manage control flow between itself and the user. Memory GPT in this paper that has been released is also referred to as an LLM operating system. It's an LLM framework which helps large language models to manage memory. And it actually emulates how an operating system in computers or phones work. So in this video, I'm going to tell you exactly how MemGPT works, and I'll be showing you how to run MemGPT locally with any LLM of your choice. Here's a diagram of how the architecture of MemGPT looks like. Now, essentially, there are actually three components in this which are extremely important to how MemGPT functions. The very first thing is something called main context. And main context is quite similar to how main memory in an operating system works. It is a fixed amount of memory. And in the case of MemGPT, main context is equivalent to the context size of the large language model that you're using. So for example, if we were using something like GPT-4 alongside MemGPT, the main context size would be 8,000. Now the second part of MemGPT is something called external context. And this is arguably the most important part of MemGPT because it enables it to have unlimited memory. The external context acts like virtual memory in an operating system. It has an unlimited amount of tokens that you can store depending on the database that you're using. And between the main context and external context, there is data that is being transferred and this data being transferred is controlled by something called functions. Now, MemGPT uses functions to move data between main context and external context, very similar to how things work in an operating system as well. So main context is the standard fixed context window in modern language models. Anything in main context is considered in context and it can be accessed by the large language model processor during inference. External context, however, refers to any information that is held outside of the large language model's fixed context window. So to actually make use of data which is stored within the external context, it has to be moved into the main context so that it can be used during an inference to the large language model. So main context can actually be divided into three different things. So the first thing that main context actually contains is system instructions. So system instructions hold the base large language model instructions. So for example, information describing MemGPT functions and the control flow to the large language model. They also hold conversational context, which holds a first in first out queue of recent event history. So for example, messages between the agent and the user. The third thing which main context holds is something called working context which serves as a working memory scratch pad for the agent. So here's an example of main context at work. MemGPT asks a question, hello chat, welcome. I'm excited to embark on this journey with you as a PhD student in computer science. I can only imagine the, I can only imagine the fascinating ideas you're juggling. Can you share what you're currently working on? I'm all ears. The user responds with, I took the day off. My mom, Brenda, baked me a birthday cake. It was my favorite chocolate lava. So automatically what MemGPT does is it stores this information into its working context. So it adds birthday equals to 11th October. It remembers that. And it also stores what your favorite cake is. So by storing this information into working context, it has already 
started to make use of memory in a more efficient way. Now let's look at external context. Now, as I've mentioned before, external context is the most important thing in MemGPT. So what exactly is it? External context refers to out of context storage that lies outside the context window of the large language model processor. And it is very similar to disk memory in operating systems. Another thing to note is that information which is stored in the external context is not immediately visible to the large language model processor. However, it can be brought into main context through appropriate function calls. In practice, the underlying storage in external context can take a lot of different forms, which can be configured for very specific tasks. For example, when it comes to chatbots, it actually makes sense to store the full conversation between the user and the agent into the external context versus actually keeping it in the main context itself. The next thing that we should be looking at is how exactly is data being stored by MemGPT. So according to the research paper, they make use of databases to store both text documents as well as embeddings and vectors. And also this provides several ways for the large language model processor to query external context. So for example, MemGPT is actually able to query data inside of external storage based on things like timestamps, uh, text-based, as well as embedding-based search. So by being able to query in these different forms, MemGPT is effectively able to search for the right thing to actually bring into main context to do an inference on. Now let's take a look at an example of external context in work with MemGPT. So here's a chat, for example. Hello chat, it's a pleasure to finally have a conversation with you. I'm Samantha. I understand that you're studying computer science and have a keen interest in pre-dynamic areas like Formula One and sailing. What in particular draws you to these areas? And then the user responds with speed, of course, the thrill and the adrenaline. Now, there's a system warning which happens in MemGPT where the conversation history will soon reach its maximum length and be trimmed. Make sure to save any important information from the conversation to your memory before it is removed. So this system warning gets triggered when the max token limit for the main context is about to be reached. And at this point, MemGPT triggers this warning so that information from the main context is actually stored inside of the external context. So as soon as this warning is issued, MemGPT decides to store a few parameters from this conversation into external storage. So in this case, it stores key personality traits. Now that we understand how MemGPT works, what exactly is its main context and external context, let's take a look at how it performs at various tasks when it's put to test against, for example, things like GPT-4 and GPT-3.5. So one of the main tasks that the researchers tested MemGPT on was for deep memory retrieval. And deep memory retrieval is essentially when the agent is asked a specific question about a topic which was discussed in a prior discussion. And that could be either between one to five sessions prior. The agent's response is then scored against the gold answer. Usually in large language models, when we're referring to the gold answer, we're referring to human generated answers. And that is what this is being tested against. And as you can see, MemGPT outperforms GPT-4 and 3.5 as well. The difference between GPT-4 and MemGPT is honestly not a lot, but there is a significant difference between MemGPT and GPT-3.5. The second task at which MemGPT was tested against was how good it was at opening conversations based on past sessions and it was compared with the gold opener, which is actually a human baseline. So essentially how a human would ask questions based on what has been said before. And it seems that if MemGPT is used only with its recall storage, it doesn't perform as well. And if, if it's using its working context only or working context plus recall storage, we do see that it performs much better. So the reason why MemGPT doesn't perform as well with just recall storage only is because MemGPT doesn't actually check for context initially when it asks a question. 
But since MemGPT generally does not attempt to search the conversation history before generating an opener, having recall storage only doesn't benefit MemGPT. That's why we see that it performs much better with working context. Another very important test for benchmarking MemGPT and how it performs was with document analysis. So that was something which was a very key factor that was mentioned early on in this paper on how helpful MemGPT would be for things like documents and basically large files which don't do as well when it comes to GPT, GPT 3.5 and other traditional large language models simply because of the limited token size. This graph right here is particularly interesting because you can see GPT's for performance slightly increase when the number of documents are increasing slightly. However, past this red dotted line, we see models like GPT-4 have a significant drop in accuracy when it comes to document analysis, and also the same with GPT-3.5, but definitely we see that GPT-4 has a much more significant drop in accuracy over an increase in documents retrieved. However, you can see that with using MemGPT with these LLMs, we see a stable rate of accuracy throughout an increase in the documents retrieved. So despite seeing an increase in documents and significantly larger uh, documents, we do see that the accuracy values achieved with MemGPT actually are stable. And that is very impressive. Let's take a look at some of the limitations that were mentioned in this paper. So one of the first things that the researchers admitted is that MemGPT actually leverages OpenAI's GPT-4 models that are fine-tuned specifically for function calling. And although they use similar LLMs and they try to test it out on things like Llama 70B, which also has been fine-tuned for function calling, it just didn't perform as well and it would actually generate incorrect function calls or even hallucinate functions outside of the provided schema. So that is why they do conclude the paper by stating that to get the most reasonable performance, you have to be using it on GPT-4 models. And they also state that this could possibly change in the future with more open source models coming out, which can handle function calls better. And this could potentially improve as well. Now that we understand how MemGPT works, let's download and run it locally. The first thing we want to do is head on over to MemGPT's GitHub page. I'll link it in the description box below. There are a lot of instructions on the various commands that we can use when we're running it. First off, we can start by actually downloading MemGPT's Python library. So it already has a Python library that we can easily download on Terminal. So let's head on over to Terminal. Once you have opened Terminal, the first thing we can start off by doing is actually creating a Python environment. So we can start off by doing Python 3 m vn, and you can name this MemGPT. I've already created this, so go ahead and run this command. Once you finish running that command, what you wanna do is actually activate it. So we're gonna do source memgpt slash bin slash activate. Once the virtual environment has been activated, we wanna download the Python library for memgpt. So do pip install py memgpt. After the library has been downloaded, we need to now set our OpenAI API key in Terminal. We can do this with a variety of ways. If you're on Mac, copy this command and enter it into Terminal. And if you're on Windows, you can use the following command as well. Make sure to replace this part with your actual API key for OpenAI. After you've done all this, let's go ahead and configure memgpt. So we wanna do memgpt configure, once you do this, you'll get a question asking you if you want to enable OpenAI with MemGPT and you can type yes. You will also get a question asking uh, if you want to enable MemGPT with Azure. Right now we don't need it, so I'm typing no. And then they say select a default preset. I'm just entering MemGPT and I'm going to pick GPT-4 to start off with given some default personas. So sample POV, memgpt starter or memgpt doc. I'm gonna pick memgpt starter. These personas are simply initialized to act a certain way. So for example, memgpt starter might be something very basic 
And once you click on that, you have something called CHPHD or basic. I'm just going to go ahead with basic. After you've selected a persona, you can do memgpt run. You'll get asked a question if you'd like to use an existing agent, you can type no, and then it will create a new agent for you and you can hit enter to begin. So since this is our first time running this, it starts off by assuming that our name is Chad, but you can easily change this by letting it know your name and it's going to remember it. So we can start off by saying, hi, my name is Smitha. Hi, my name is Smitha and I love learning ML. So once you once you gave it this new information, what it does is it's storing the new information you give it. So instead of saying, hmm, interesting, Chad's name is now given as Smitha. It's possible that Chad was just a placeholder and Smitha is the actual user. Additionally, Smitha's revealed an interest in ML. This is a great opportunity to connect over a mutual interest. But first, let's correct the record in my core memory to make sure I remember Smitha correctly. So what it has done is it's now updating its core memory to replace the name, the placeholder name Chad with my name Smitha. And now that it has updated its memory, it's time to engage with Smitha's interest in ML. So as you can see, it's already updating data based on what we have given it. And we can go on to do further tasks. What I'm going to be showing you next is how to load a file and store it into the external context of memgpt so that you can use it for reference and also ask questions about your file. I have a txt file here which contains all of the Oscar winners from 1928. What I'm going to be doing is actually giving this file to memgpt by loading it onto memgpt with the following command. Load, we're going to do memgpt load directory dash name, and you can call this Oscar winners. And we're going to give it input file dash dash in input files. And I'm going to follow this up with the full address of the file that I'm trying to load onto memgpt. So once you try to load this, you're going to get an estimate from OpenAI for the embedding cost of loading this file. You can go ahead and click yes. The cost of this embedding depends on the size of your data set. My data set is pretty large. You can go for a smaller data set and it would be significantly cheaper. And this is the full address of where the embeddings of this data set is stored. Once we have loaded our data set with Oscar winners, we can now run memgpt. with data source as Oscar winners. And for would you like to use an existing agent, you can click no. Since I'm creating a new agent, again, it will recognize me as Chad because that's the placeholder name. But what we want to do is we want to trigger it to actually look at its archival memory where the Oscar winners data set is. So we can enter this command of saying search your archival memory for it to do so. According to memgpt's documentation, they do mention that to encourage your agent to reference its archival memory, we recommend adding phrases like search your archival memory. After I've asked it to search for its archival memory and also I said search for data on Oscar winners, it now comes back and says I found several Oscar related records in my archival memory. These include information about winners in various categories across different years. For instance, the film Birdman won Best Picture in 2015, in another example, etc. There are a ton of different commands to play around with as well. So for example, you can start to save your own personas that you create, uh, which contains data that you've been talking to and fro with memgpt with. So that's awesome. And also you can create presets to run different agents with memgpt. So there are so many things that you can do with memgpt. This is pretty amazing and this is just growing as of now. There's so many integrations which are being built on top of this. 
for example, with Autogen as well. So if you're interested in learning more, check out the GitHub link and also check out the link to the paper in the description box below. If you like this video, check out this video right here on Autogen to learn more about how you can build different AI agents which can collaborate together to solve any task that you define.